I'd like to introduce our newest sponsor, Swim Angelfish. Swim Angelfish is an online certification program that strengthens your teaching curriculum to serve swimmers of all abilities. Swim Angelfish will prepare you and your instructors with the skills to teach swimmers with autism, physical disabilities, anxiety, sensory and motor conditions, and more. Learn to teach skills faster and with more comfort with Swim Angelfish. Apply for an only alpha pool product scholarship and receive up to 50% off your certification. Go to swimangelfish.com today to apply. Looking to host your first swim meet or replacing an old timing system? Run a swim meet with ease from your laptop using Superior Swim Timing. You can use Superior Swim Timing with your existing equipment, or they can provide you with a complete timing solution, including deck harnesses, buttons, and starter. SST is fully compatible with HiTech and Team Unify, as well as Colorado, Dactronics, and Amiga touchpads. Go to superiorswimtiming.com to learn more and be sure to tell them I sent you. Michael Ball, welcome to the podcast, mate. How are you? Well, Hawkey, thanks for uh, inviting me. I think, mate. What, what, <laughs> I think, <laughs> mate, it's inviting you. What are you talking about? I invited you about seventeen different times, and you said no to me. Uh, Sixteen of those, you've said yes once, and this is the one. So I appreciate it. I'm a, I'm a very slow mover, Hawkey. <laughs> I can tell that. Now, listen, where are you coming from, mate? Are you Long Bay Jail right now? Where is this? We're in quarantine in Darwin, a place called Howard Springs. So we've been there for about three nights. And uh, we're just doing a two weeks time in quarantine before we're allowed to go back to our home base. How does everybody feel about this quarantine? I think it's fine. Like anyone that travels overseas, whether you're a sports person, whether you're a politician, whether, whether you're a member of the public, everyone's got to do their two weeks. So I think it's one of the reasons why, you know, the Australian government has been able to keep the numbers relatively low. So um, I think it's a, you know, it's a, it's sort of a necessary evil, I suppose you'd say. So you know, everyone was very aware we had to do it. So we're just sort of passing the time. Um, you know, a few days down, we've got a little bit to go. Mate, talk to me about the restrictions that, that, that you're experiencing while you're there. Like, what are the what are the conditions that you're under right now? Well, I'm just sitting in the room at the moment. Uh, we're in a we're in a facility. Um, you know, it's it's sort of a, a modular facility. There's a whole bunch of of different rooms, and uh, we came in on a flight from Tokyo with other sports people. There were uh, who who was on there. There was. Um, I think there were some shooters. There were the rugby sevens girls. Obviously, there was us. There was a whole bunch of different people in the same flight, uh, and we're all sort of staying at this facility. We got bussed in from the airport, picked up our uh, room keys, got taken to our rooms, and uh, we've just got to really stay in the confines of the room for the two weeks. We're allowed to go out and do washing um, mm. a couple of times a week. 
we've got a little balcony just out the front of each of the little modular rooms. And on that balcony, we're allowed to do a little bit of exercise. We can go out and get fresh air. So I think we're really privileged actually that we're here because if we were doing quarantine in Brisbane or Sydney or Melbourne, we'd be stuck inside a hotel room. So we, you know, we, we find ourselves in quite a fortunate position of being able to go outside into the fresh air. Yeah, well, listen, man, I'm not going to be too critical of the of the stance that Australia's taken on this. It is, it is what it is. Um, yeah, look, it's totally different in America. Everybody is, well, most people are vaccinated here, so we're, we're lucky in that sense. And, um, you know, people are back to kind of normal life. And it's different. It's just, it's just, it's, it's strange that each country's facing this in a different way. But um, beyond that, mate, listen, first of all, Congratulations. I mean, fantastic Olympics for you personally, fantastic Olympics for the Australian swim team. Um, you should be very proud, right? Yeah, um, I think it was one of the best teams I've been away with. Um, you know, there's a real strong camaraderie uh, between everyone. You know, the the sinners, the coaches, the staff, um, probably one of the best teams that I've been on. I think um, – you know, when you have a bit of success, I think it br brings everyone a little bit closer as well. But um, it's certainly a privilege to be on this team. What do you attribute it to? Um, you know, uh, th there's obviously been, you know, um, criticism of the Australian swim team in the past at the Olympic Games, you know, maybe the past few Olympics. But uh, there was a clear um, camaraderie amongst the coaches and the athletes at this one. There was uh, obviously success. I mean, you guys were we're swimming outstandingly. So what do you attribute the success to? Well, it's a combination of different things. I think, um, you know, we've got some outstanding athletes working in programs with outstanding coaches. You know, the coaches are really doing a great job. Um, it's quite mixed when you look at the experience of the coaches. <clears throat> Pardon me. There's, you know, there's some older coaches, um, you know, in their 50s and 60s. And then you've got the uh, younger coaches sort of down their 30s and 40s. And I think, you know, the younger coaches, you know, like the Dean Boxels, the Chris Mooney's, uh, you know, the Mick Palfrey's, um, you know, did an outstanding job with the athletes that they had over the last, not just the last 12 months, but the last four or five years coming into this. And then you've got your old, more experienced coaches like your Vince Rallies, uh, Chris Nesbis, those sorts of people that have been around the block a few times, um, all having great success with the athletes that they've got on their program. Yeah. I mean, you, you talk about working hard. I, I don't doubt that you guys have worked hard in the past, but it, it's it's beyond that. It's more than that. So, like, there's got to be some things that you've seen recently, maybe within the last couple of years, where Australia is really getting it right. Um, is this certain things you can pinpoint to say that, like, we're doing that well right now? I think, you know, from a personal point of view, probably one of the best things that we've done in recent times is the national event camp that Rowan Taylor, our national head coach, uh, organised in February this year. I think that mm. was a real step forward where all the best swimmers in fly back breast and free uh, got together for a week on the Gold Coast. They all went to different pools, but we're all staying in the same hotel, mm. you know, getting together for meetings, doing group activity, all that sort of thing. And I think one of the good things that, Rowan came up with the idea it was um, on the Tuesday morning of the camp, unbeknownst to all the swimmers, they were all down having breakfast and Rowan just got them together and said, guys, we've got a special surprise today. We've divided the team into green and gold. We're going to have a relay competition where you're going to be uh, representing one of those two teams. Um, he had uh, four coaches for those teams and all, all the other coaches were assisted to them. Um, the head coaches, there was Peter Bishop and myself were with Team Green and Vince Rally and Simon Cusack were the head coaches for gold. And we'd known what was going on, the coaches, but the Sooners didn't know. So we got together the day before and just picked the teams, you know, trying to make them as even as we could. And, you know, they all got up and, and swam in the relay. So it was one of those things where, um, you know, they didn't know it was coming up. It was certainly getting them out of their comfort zone. And um, they all got together and, and raced really, really hard. And um, I think that was a really good, uh, you know, thing to do, a really good initiative to, you know, get some camaraderie and some team spirit amongst the swimmers and the coaches. Yeah, mate, a lot of that was actually um, documented on Head Above Water, the, the documentary that they did um, on Amazon Prime, um, which, which I felt like they did an outstanding job. But it really gave us an insight 
into what Rowan was doing as the new head coach of Australia and, and what what you guys were doing as, as a unit, uh, I thought exactly what you talked about right there, I thought in terms of the uh, getting the group together, I, I mean, I, I know for a fact the US wasn't doing anything like that uh, at that period of time, um, especially during COVID. So you guys, the, the way that Australia had handled COVID at that point in time, you guys were still free and open to kind of move around and get together. Um, whereas most countries were, were in a lockdown at that point in time. So, uh, yeah, I, I felt like that was really well done and it was it was very impressive to watch that on that documentary. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. it was uh, good. Like, I think one of Rowan's, um, you know, philosophies is that, uh, you know, he treats the Australian swimming team like a club team. Um, and, you know, he you know, he wants all the swimmers within the club or within the Australian team all pulling for each other, um, you know, they're there, they've got each other's backs, all, all those sorts of mantras um, are things that Rowan uses as the cornerstone. And Rowan's probably had one of the most successful clubs in Australia, the Nunna Wadding Club in Victoria. He was the head coach of there for a number of years and everyone knows that, you know, Rowan did a great job of, um, you know, running that club as the head coach and he's taken that same sort of philosophy onto the Australian swimming team. Mate, listen, you were one of the leading coaches in Australia when I was swimming, and I'm an old man now. Um, <laughs> you, I mean, you've been around for a little while. But listen, um, how, how do you keep going? How do you how do you keep being at the top of your game in this um, and having the success that you have? And we'll go into kind of Emma McKeon and, and the success you've had with her at this game. But personally, how do you keep going? Well, I think I'm I'm really motivated by you know, trying to improve athletes, trying to get them better, and obviously the litmus test for us all is the Olympics. So it's you know trying to get that Olympic success. That's what really drives me. Like it was nice in uh, Rio, we had some nice success there with um, you know three of the members of our group, um, you know Maddie Groves, uh, Mitch Larkin, and Emma got on the podium individually there. And, you know, if you go back to 2012, I was coaching Park Taiwan. He got on the podium there in Bronte Barrett. Um, and then 2008 with Stephanie. So it was just nice to, you know, feel like you're making an impact, uh, you know, trying to assist the good athletes that you've got in your program to try and excel and achieve at that very high level. Well, what is it for you? What are, the, what are the cornerstones to success in terms of, like, if someone was looking at your program or just analysing you, what are the things that you believe in for for coaches and athletes within your program to have success? I mean, what are the things that you just don't compromise on? Well, I think it's just that hard work success paradigm. Like I think, you know, the athletes have, have to have a very clear understanding that if they want to improve and get better, they've got to work hard. Like people, it's easy to talk about working hard, but um, I like to see action, um, you know, so there's no greater – you know, testament to what someone's trying to do, uh, you know, than watching them over training, not over a day or a session, but over the course of weeks and months and years. And I think when you see that, you know, high level consistent work day in, day out, you know, you know that the people who you've got in your program are, are ready to make an impact at that Olympic level. Mate, you've had two of uh, Australia's most successful women in, in Steph Rice and now Emma McKeon and, and what she's done in Tokyo. Um, what are the what are the similarities you see in in coaching both of those women? Is there any? I think they're totally different people. Like Emma uh, is very um, uh, introverted. Uh, you know, she's she's a good communicator, but she's just quiet. Whereas Stephanie's the probably the total opposite of that. You know, she's mm -hmm. very uh, you know vibrant, bubbly. Uh, you know, very confident, very self assured, all that sort of stuff. So I think. You know, you see the same thing in the pool. Like, you know, you see that, um, you know, that desire to work really hard to get themselves better. Um, I think, uh, you know, that's what I learned as a coach, you know, working with someone of, um, you know, Stephanie's quality. She was just unbelievable. You know, when she had a goal that she wanted to achieve, like nothing would stand in the road of her getting there. And I think Emma is like that, but she does it in a little bit more of a quiet manner. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I had Emma on the podcast, and she was she was open, but you could tell that there was there was you know she's a reserved woman. She's very um, 
introspective you know she's she's a thinker she's very intelligent but she keeps a lot of it's probably thinking a lot but um doesn't express over express it you know and um is that difficult to to coach someone like that have you did you struggle at first or was it um how did you find that you could communicate with her the best Well, I think, you know, you sort of learn from coaches that have gone before you. And I know that Gennady Tereski, you know, taught a number of things to uh, us coaches when he was here in Australia. And one of the things I remember him saying at a talk that he gave to the coaches was that each of the swimmers that you've got in your program has got a different lock. And you've got a pocket full of keys and you've got to try and find the right key for that swimmer. And I think, you know, your ability as a coach to communicate with the athletes that you've got in front of you was instrumental in, the absolute best out of them like they're not all the same they're very individual they're very different uh it doesn't mean they're not going to have success uh, it just means you've got to try and find a way of connecting with that with that you know when we had that um your national butterfly event camp um i was the head coach for fly and during that week I just thought about it a little bit and I think, you know, with the swimmers that are developing, I think it's important for them to realise that you haven't got to be loud. You can still be quiet, you can be reserved, but still perform really well. So during that butterfly camp, I asked Steph Rice to come in and she spoke to the swimmers for about 20 or 30 minutes. And then three days later, I asked Susie O'Neill to come in and much the same as as uh, Emma, you yeah, know, Susie's probably a little bit more reserved and quiet, whereas Stephanie was very open and able to talk really freely and everything else. So I think you know, the message I was trying to get across, you know, you haven't got to be like Steph or you haven't got to be like Susie. You've got to be your own version of yourself. So it's it's being comfortable in your own skin, uh, you know, finding, uh, I guess, a program and a coach that you can work comfortably in, um, you know, on the road to getting getting the best out of yourself at those big meets. Yeah. Well, listen, mate, I'm a sprint freestyler at heart and, uh, and I love the, love the sprints. As you know, I have no idea how to get a woman to swim 51 in the hundred freestyle. So teach me, my friend, T talk to me. How do, how do I get someone to swim 51 in the hundred free as a woman? Wow. Yeah, it was good. Look, I think with Emma, with the hundreds, um, you know, we made the decision last December. Um, I sat down with her after the state titles in December and I just sort of said to her, I said, and look, I, I really don't think you can do all the events that you may qualify for for the Olympics. And at that stage, it was the 200 free, the 100 free, the 100 fly and, and potentially the 50 free. And I said, you know, something's got to give, you know, if you do do all those events uh, and make it all the way through, it's four times three is 12 plus four relays. It's 16 races, which I think, is too big a program. Like I know Michael Phelps has done it before and everything else, but um, I think, you know, trying to do a, a Michael Phelps is not what's going to work for Emma McKeon. So, you know, back about eight months ago, I had the conversation with her and I, I said, look, in my opinion, I think, you know, the 200 freestyle is an event over the last couple of years that you probably, you know, just reached that plateau when you see 154 every time you get up and race. But I really believe she's capable of swimming 153. You know, from what I see in training, um, you know, from what, I, from what I see in competition, you know, 2016, she was going 154 and she's still going 154. So I thought, you know, that, that event seems to have plateaued for her a little bit. But the 100 free seems to be the event that she's really making moves in. So I guess just rolled the dice, uh, spoke to Emma about that. She was a little bit reluctant, a little bit hesitant at first, but I think, once she saw when we changed the training round a little bit, that her ability to be able to sprint got a little bit better. Um, I think she came more on board with the decision. How, oh, I appreciate you sharing that. How is it that Australia is so deep in women's sprint freestyle right now? What, I'm, what are you guys doing that is so different to the rest of the world? Is it is it coaching? Is it talent? Is it a combination of the two? Are you doing something that no one else is doing like what's the secret here i think it's hard to put a handle on it to be honest like i think we've always done a good job with the female sprint we've had some very good male sprinters obviously kyle winning the olympic games last time i just think it's you know we're probably very free in sharing information when we had those national event camps so 
Simon Cusack's done an outstanding job and still is, by the way. You know, over the last eight or ten years, Kate and Bronte Campbell have been awesome mm. Mm. and they've been the benchmark. And every time, you know, the girls get together on those sprint camps, they're going hammer and time and everyone can, can see and watch and learn what that A standard is. And um, I guess it's, you know, coaches and swimmers going back to their home programs and not accepting anything less than that when they go to their home program. It's like, you know, mm. it's, it's just awesome to see that you know, fantastic standard that Bronte and Kate have set. And uh, mm. it's up to all the coaches that have got swimmers at their camp to go home and keep that standard up. Talk to us about your philosophy then in terms of getting a woman to go faster. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to give me specifics, but, I mean, just give me as much as you can in terms of, how do you improve speed in a woman so that she can – I mean, well, what's your philosophy? Let, just tell me that. My philosophy is pretty open and changing, I suppose. Like I started out coaching at the Olympic level in 92, and on that team I had a couple of 50-metre swimmers on there, Darren Lang and Angus Waddell. So I sort of started with sprinters, then I evolved into middle distance and probably going back a little bit to sprint now. But uh, – I try and learn from the swimmers that are in there. Like I think it's it's you know looking at each individual athlete that's in front of you and look at looking at the strengths and weaknesses of that individual and trying to, you know, just trying to get them better. Obviously, a hundred is that meeting point of speed and endurance. And I think if you go too much one way, if you get too much speed and not enough endurance, you've got an athlete mm. that can get out there but can't get back. Mm. And if you go too much endurance and not enough speed, you've got an athlete that can come but they can't get out. So. It's, it's really challenging to try and find the right mix for each of the people that you've got in your program. But that's probably the way that I look at it. Um, with specifically Emma, um, you know, technically her, her father was a coach for most of the years. Ron just did an absolutely outstanding job with her technically. There's really not much there that, um, you know, we needed to work on. There's a couple of little tweaks we've got to make every now and then. But, uh, you, know, you know, sort of essentially her technique is very, very strong. Uh, her skills, we've got a, 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 a physiologist or a biomechanist, she hates me calling her a physiologist, Jess Coronas, who's been working with Emma since she's been about 12 years of age. And Jess does an outstanding job on the skills, on the starts, turns and finishes. Um, yeah. You know, Jess comes to the program a couple of times a week and, uh, you know, hones in on those. She's very, very uh, intuitive, very good. We do a lot of filming on, on uh, that sort of stuff. So it's just having that team around you that are helping. Uh, we've got a very good strength and conditioning coach. Scott Dickinson has been working with us for the last two or three years. And I think that was probably the thing, uh, you know, when I said I had a conversation in December, I also included Scott and all the support team in that conversation. And I said, one of the things I think we need to do with Emma is get her stronger. So we made the decision in January to drop her workload back in the pool a little bit because she mm. She was doing a lot of two events. So for the month of January, we just dropped the right back and only doing sessions. And in those sessions, do a lot of lactate accumulator work. We just did a lot of sprints. And then on the Saturday morning, which was at the end of the week, we did a little bit of lactate stuff but didn't overdo it because I thought that um, Emma in the past, when she turns up to gym, she's always got the fatigue of training. So the nervous system's quite down and it's hard to get strength gains when you're fronting up the gym fatigue. So for four weeks, um, you know, the main focus of what we did in January was trying to build up that strength block. And the aim was to keep that or to, you know, try and maintain it, uh, you know, from February right the way through the Olympics. But, you know, January saw some good strength gains. And a big part of that was dropping the volume back, doing less sessions and not quite as far, but just for one month. Uh, right. I've got to say, uh, Em was a little bit nervous about doing this because she was used to doing, you know, five to six kilometres a session, you know, doing pretty solid main sets. So it was a really, really big shift in the mindset to do it. She felt a little bit uncomfortable. But then when we saw, you know, we uh, you know saw the results when she went to the sprint camp in February, she was, you know, swimming pretty fast. She was pushing quite fast times for 50s and 25s and uh, all of those sorts of things. So we could see that. You know, see the improvements very, very rapidly in that. Give me an idea on that. What, what's the what's the fastest you've seen her push a, a twenty five, a fifty, and a hundred in practice? Probably don't do a lot of 
push. Um, 25 dives, she'll sort of hit 10. She was going 10 sevens. Oh, wow. 10 That's eights. Good. I think I was a bit quick wonder. I got a 10 six in the warm up. I, I got a 10 six in the warm up for the um, 50 freestyle that day, which was the quickest that I've ever got. That's, you know, sort of without a suit on. But, you know, on a good day in training without a suit on, she'll sort of swim 10 nine. That's to the wall, not to the, to the head. Um, you know, she pushes 25s for 50s. Um, you know, she I pushes 25s, push really. Mm. Wow, yep. Mm. Oh, quite a few of the Australian girls are, are sort of doing that. Um, yeah, mm. wow. pretty fast. And then, it's good. And, the, and then, uh, I was talking to Cody Simpson, uh, who, who you took over his training. Um, and, and he told me at the end of practice one day, she pushed a, a 55 for 100 free. That's that's pretty. Pretty nasty. Yeah, probably one of the best things I saw her do. We did a, a little block set of hundreds where we went four, then a small three, then a small two, then a small and, and uh, you know then a single one. Mm. And each of the hundreds had to get faster. The four were on one thirty. The three were on one forty-five. The two were on two minutes, and then the single one at the end. And probably the best day I saw her, she pushed a fifty-one eight at the end. That's with a suit on. So she was like 62s on the first round of four, 56s on the three, a 50, 53 and 54 on the two, and then she went a 51 on the on the last one, you know, all from a push. Are you talking short course or long course? Short course, short course, not long course. Short course <laughs> okay. with a suit on. Short, short course, course with a suit. I was like, <laughs> "What on earth?" Short course with a suit. Short course meters with a suit on. Okay, that's that's good. That's good knowledge, though. Wow, that's that's fast. That's really good. Dang, uh, mate. I know that. Um, let me talk about this. This this was kind of the one of the first few times you guys have gone to the kind of the five weeks out. You know the, you know taper and shave and race and qualify and then you know you got about four or five weeks to the olympics what was your approach in that how did you and your team kind of uh, approach that whole period of time yeah it's kind of new territory for us in australia doing that um probably the closest we came to it i think it was 2014 we had pan packs over in Japan, then we had to come back two weeks later and some of the Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast. Mm. Uh, so that was, um, oh, sorry, it's the other way around. Commonwealth Games were over in Scotland, I beg your pardon. Mm. And then we came back and swam in pan packs on the Gold Coast. So there was only about two weeks or three weeks between those two meets. But we haven't had a lot of experience doing it. But, you know, for all the group within my squad, uh, we fully rested everyone for the trials but with emma mm. we just gave her like a week's rest just to freshen up to get you know to do enough to get her on the team and then you know gave her the full week rest for the actual olympics well uh, hang on say that again so you gave her a week rest for the trials um in terms of the fear of missing an individual event did you have any fear in that Oh, there's always the fear. Like, you, you can't underestimate anyone. Uh, obviously, you know, you've got the two Campbell girls and everything else. But I think you just look at what happened in the past. Like, the three previous meets, her and Kate battled out the 100 free. They both went 52s. They were going 52 fours and 52 fives sort of during the season. And for those meets, she was only sort of getting sort of three or four days, a little freshen up coming in. So, you know, you're pretty confident she was going to swim 52 five or a better coming in and you were, you know, just hoping that was good enough to try and make the team. The 50, I had no idea what she'd do in that because she hadn't really done many of them before. Uh, and the 100 butterfly, uh, there was really uh, Brianna Throssell, uh, Emma and Maddie Groves, but Maddie Groves ended up not swimming at trial. So there was a risk with doing it. But I thought, you know, with Emma, she's in a, she was in a position to try and do something at the Olympics. So I didn't want to, sort of give her the full two weeks. I just thought, look, if we can just get by with the week, um, you know, that should be okay. Some easy for a couple of days after the trials and we started to get back into it um, on the Wednesday of the week straight after trials. And we got that week through with modified main sets. Then we had a two-week block, which was a week in Brisbane of working hard and a week in Cairns at our training camp. And then we started to sort of drop it down from there. 
Right. Now, that week that you were able to come back and do some work, were you at full capacity then or you were at kind of like 80, 90 percent? Where, where are you at? Yeah, probably somewhere between the 80 and 90 percent was, was uh, probably where we're at. So probably not going quite as full on, but still, you know, getting up and working at race speeds or faster on, um, you know, on the work that we were doing. How many um, how many workouts a week was she doing throughout the season in in the pool? Yeah, she does nine swimming sessions a week. Mhm. And then in the gym, how many was she hitting there? Well, January she went up to four, but normally it's three. Three gym sessions. She goes to Pilates, two stationary bike. And there's core stuff that they do, you know, before every session. So, um, yeah, you know, she's working working pretty hard. I'd say core she's stuff. more working like a, you know, like a, you know, like a like a sort of two hundred meter, hundred meter person rather than a fifty hundred meter person. All oh, right. Okay. So, were you surprised then that she actually won the fifty freestyle at the Olympics? Well, I thought she'd be close. Like she went twenty when she went twenty three nine at trials. Like I, I'd sort of look back through history, and twenty four zero seemed to be the marker that most people were getting to at all the major meets. So I thought somewhere around that twenty four zero mark would be, you know, quite competitive there. Um, you know, I wasn't sure how how far she could go, but um, I think you know her confidence was quite high coming into that last day, and um, you know she was able to, to uh, you know put a good one together, which was nice. Yeah, listen, I mean, it's just so impressive to watch her. She's she's so beautiful in the water in terms of technically and the way she sits in the water and the way she, you know, she's got – she can control her speed and she's got endurance. I mean, it's it's like she's got it all. Um, does she have any fears or doubts? Or, like, wh- when you're talking to her, how difficult is it to get her in the position where she's where she feels unbeatable? Yeah, I think, you know, the last Olympics was a great learning curve for, for Em. You know, she had mixed results there. She did really well and she was mediocre in a couple of races and she wasn't good in, in some races. And I think, you know, when you have that, uh, you know, success, it teaches you a lot. But I think when you have the failure, it teaches you more. Mm. So I think, you know, it wasn't a pleasant feeling for her, that 100 butterfly in Rio. And, uh, you know, she was very, very motivated and keen to try and, you know, put a, put a best foot forward and try and get the absolute best out of herself, you know, by the time Tokyo came around. Like, I think, we, you know, when that announcement was made about Tokyo being postponed 12 months, like Emma was inconsolable for a couple of days. She was really disappointed because she was in a great position last year to do something. Like, I think everyone else in the squad was kind of expecting it, but Emma really thought that the Olympics was going to go ahead last year so she did not take that well at all but uh you know we sent her home with her family you know she's very very much a family person she went you know within the cocoon of her family for a few months and she was doing a lot of workouts down there let's run a a a swim school down in uh, Wollongong she was doing a little bit of swimming down there doing a little bit of gym down there but just getting her thoughts together just centering herself and by the time she came back to the Gold Coast to train um you know she was sort of ready to go with all, all the guns blazing. Yeah. Uh, and just the last question on her before I move on to some others. Um, in, in terms of the build-up and the preparation, did you know that you had something special as you were going through this preparation? You know, you're, you're turning up to practice every day. You're seeing what she's doing. Are you kind of just rubbing your hands together like, wow, this is, this is extraordinary what I'm looking at? Well, I think I think one of the one of the major uh, you know contributors you can't put a number on, but I think you know the training program that you work within is just such an important asset for you. And I think you know Cody coming in. There's a boy called Flynn Bailden. His dad was an Olympian, Andy. Um, you know they're two of the male swimmers that we've got in our squad, and um, you know they've just been absolutely fantastic, as well as all the other people within our squad. But you know, having that non-confrontational, you know, male, female, people pushing you in training, like Flynn's a 51-0 swimmer, Katie's mm. a 52 fly. So I was matching them up quite a lot. And I think when you match the girls up too often, it can be detrimental. But I think having that boy-girl 
combo together. Um, really, there's no, you know, there's no antagonism. There's no vindictiveness. It's just, you know, one athlete up against the other and they're just trying to get the best out of each other. And I think, you know, Cody and Flynn have been absolutely fantastic for um, M. And I think it's it's really contributed, uh, you know, quite significantly to, to M's, uh, you know, great success in Tokyo. Nice strategy, mate. So you use Cody Simpson to help Emma McKeon win gold in Tokyo. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. <laughs> no, you no, did. That's fantastic. It's smart coaching, mate. That's other. good. That's good. Um, uh, that That's brilliant, mate. So, well, talk to me about some well, of the other – you must have had a couple of other people in Tokyo as well. Who were they? Uh, yeah, I had Emily Seabom. Emily Seabom has been swimming with uh, – our group since 2019 after world's trials mm. so she didn't have a very good summit worlds and um sort of made the move down and um you know she's been great for the group you know she had great great success in tokyo it's just good to see her getting back down to the time she was swimming back in you know 2012 it was uh, awesome she did outstanding mate congratulations on that uh what took the bronze in the 200 back is that right beg your pardon she took the bronze in the 200 back didn't she she did. Yeah, she did. It was a great swim. Like, it didn't look like she was going to get there. She left it all to the last stroke. So, I mean, I was sitting in the grandstand biting my fingernails because she was out slower than what the plan was. But, you know, she knew what she was doing. She just, uh, you know, did an awesome last 50. I think only two girls under 32 were Kaylee went 31 and then went 31 4. So she came home really well and and just, you know, just got a, just got a hand on the wall quickly there for that bronze medal, which was good. Yeah, mate. Yeah, fantastic swim. Uh, congrats on that. Yeah, four, fourth Olympics and getting on the podium. Um, sensational, mate. Yeah, that must make you real proud as well. Well, I, you know, I, I still remember having the conversation with, with them. You know, she came and saw us after the Worlds and she said that, uh, you know, she wanted to move down. And I, I just said to her, look, I'm not interested in um, you know, just coaching someone to their fourth Olympics. If you're going to come here and swim in the program, you've got to be aiming up to try and get on the podium in Tokyo. You know, for someone that's been at that level, anything short of that's just not acceptable. And uh, she said, no, that's what I want to do. And uh, I said to her, look, let's give it a trial from, you know, from September or December. And if, you know, you're not happy, then you invite If I'm not happy, then you can go somewhere else as well. But um, there hasn't been a problem, you know, the whole time that she's been there, she's been willing to work hard. And I think it's just testament to just a, her mental toughness. She's had a few things go wrong in the last, you know, two or three years. It's very difficult when you've been on the team for twelve years and you miss. Like it's a, it's a real smack on the, smack on the nose. And uh, I think you know you can only enter those smacks in the nose with, you know, with one way. You've got to come back. You know, don't get mad, get even. And you know, she's really, you know, got herself up to a, you know, to a great level again. Fifty-eight four and two six ones. You know, very, very competitive on the world scene. So it's just nice to see someone who's been around the traps for so long, get back up there again. Yeah. Well, good stuff, mate. Well, as you were talking, I'm thinking to myself, like there's so much to learn from you. Um, you know, there's a lot of coaches that watch this, as you know. You're one of the coaches that watches this. You, you learn from other coaches, and I think that's a great attribute to speak about you is like you watch and learn just as much as anybody else. But what can we learn from you, mate? Like, t tell me, what are the things that you believe in as a coach that you just hold true to every day that you think are essential to your success? Well, I think I've learned from all the coaches that coached me. You know, um, Bill Sweden was one of my coaches. Laurie Lawrence was one of my coaches. So I think they really, and you know, Dennis Persick was one of my coaches as well. So they really, you know, probably changed my philosophy and outlook on, on, on swimming, you know, spending time with them, watching the success they had, watching the failings that they had. And I think that, uh, you know, we've all got them, um, you know, so it's, I think it's the ability to be able to, to learn from your mistakes. You know, we all make mistakes. And we're all really worried about making mistakes, but, you know, I think those mistakes are okay to make as long as you learn from them. You don't make those ones again though. So, I guess, you know, there's that. Um, I'm really big on the, you know, that hard work success paradigm. Like I think there's a lot of people talk about wanting to be great, but, you know, when it comes to turning up the training pool and turning up in the gym, they're just five or six people back from the front of the line. Like I think, you know, you've got to be, you know, a hard working, you've got to, 
you've got to outwork, you've got to outskill, you've got to outdo the people who you're trying to compete against. I think there's no other way mm. to, to reach the top of the podium. Um, you know, you've got to have a great mindset. You've got to have a great support crew around you. You've got to have good partners, good families. There's just so many ducks that have got to be lined up in a row for those great performances to happen. So we're, you know, we're a, we're a piece of the puzzle, but obviously we can't do what we do if we haven't got great athletes that are willing to put themselves on the line day in, day out. So I think, um, you know, if we didn't have the cattle within our programs, we um, wouldn't be able to enjoy the success that we have. So, um, you know, making sure that you've got a good, uh, you know, a good supply or a good group of athletes within your program to work with. Um, and I think, you know, as I was saying before, like I think the importance of having a great group, like I know Dean Boxall um, is one of the coaches who I coached with for six years who was working with me in there at St Peter's and there's no better communicator in the game than, than, than Dean. He's absolutely fantastic. And uh, I think that's really one of the main reasons. Like he's, he's just so enthusiastic. Uh, and his communication skills with every athlete that he's got, uh, you know, within his program is just, you know, 10 out of 10. So I think having that ability to be able to communicate with the athletes that you've got in your program and they've got to understand that you care about them as people first and athletes second. Um, you've got to set up um, an uncompromising, hardworking program. Um, can't take shortcuts. Um, and, you know, you there's no guarantee of, of having success, but I think if you tick all those boxes, you're putting yourself in line to, um, you know, try and get the absolute best out of the people you've got in your program. Well, we finally got to the answer that I wanted. You started to talk about yourself a little bit and some things you believe in, <laughs> which is good. So, but the, how do you hold your athletes accountable? How do they, how do they know that, Hey, Bowley's not happy with me right now, or, um, or I'm doing a good job. How, how do you hold them accountable? I think it's just, you know, we talk about within our program, you know, world-class standard. Like, you know, you've got to be, can't be there all the time, especially as you get to Emily Seabom's age 29, but, you know, you've got to do things in training that other people can't do. So, you know, it's it's easy to talk about those things, but it's very difficult to get, you know, get in and do them. And, um, you know, in respect to Emma, you know, she's had those national event camps for sprint. She can see what Kate and Bronte are doing. Uh, Kate and Bronte have been the best in the world. That's the standard you've got to be at if you want to be successful in that in that 150 freestyle. So I think it's it's them, it's us selling, it's us uh, explaining to the suitors the level they've got to be at. Um, and you know you can't see it once a month. It's got to be there, you know, quite a few times a week for me to be sold on on them, um, you know, being at that level. So you know it's not talking about it, it's doing it. It's you know it's the action. Action piece is the bit that, um, you know, that's the bit that holds me to account and it's the bit that holds the athletes in the program to account. Yeah. What about your coaching style and, and maybe your philosophy in terms of like, when do you write your workouts for the day? How do you deliver your workouts to the team? Tell me that, those two things. Yeah, I, I normally quarantine about an hour for myself on a Sunday Arvo where I just sort of sit down, I grit out, the six days of the week and I piece in where the main sets are um, and I come up with the main sets. I usually make up the warm-ups and the swim, swim downs just before the session, but the main body of what I want to do, I try and do that on the Sunday. But, mm. you know, it's probably one of those things that's a, um, you know, it's a very fluid environment. If I see them not handling what we're doing, then I'll just make those little tweaks or, or changes. Mm. Um, you know, I guess my kind of measure is, whether I've had a good week or not is how well they're finishing off Saturday morning. Um, if I put in the right amount of rest and recovery, I'm, I'm sort of getting four good main sets, Monday, Arvo, Tuesday, Arvo, Thursday, Arvo, and Saturday morning mm. out of the swimmers. And if they're turning up too tight on Saturday morning, I probably haven't done a good job uh, in terms of giving them enough rest and recovery because I, I like them finishing off the week well. I think when I first started coaching, I was doing too much hard stuff at the front of the week. Mm. And then Thursday, Friday, Saturday was rubbish. So in a 16-week six, training block, I was putting in 16 good half weeks with the swimmers, not 16 full weeks. So I think that's the thing that I'm sort of mindful of now, especially with older athletes like Emma's 27, Emily's 29. It's making sure that you're giving them enough rest and recovery. You're not 
going to the well too many times, you know, you'll end up with a dry well. So, you know, you've got to make sure that they're putting the water back in the well, they're recovering themselves well, um, you know, between sessions. So you're getting those good four weeks in. Yeah. So just no, in terms I... of delivery, I, I just coach. Um, I coach alongside Janelle Pallister. Janelle uh, hmm. has got a group of 20 plus swimmers in her age group program that, um, you know, train out of the lanes beside me. She's got um, a number of great little athletes in there and um, she comes and gives us a hand on a Tuesday and Thursday morning because she doesn't uh, coach those swimmers on that morning. But for the rest of the the training sessions, I work on my own with about maybe 10 to 12 swimmers within the group there. Right, right. Yeah, very cool. So they're all I doing, like you know, they're all doing nine nine water sessions. We do two bike. There's a, there's a physiologist that works for Swimming Australia, Tommy V. He comes in on a Tuesday, Thursday morning and does 30 minutes of a pretty solid bike with the kids. We've got Alyssa, our Pilates lady, comes in once every two weeks and does a Pilates session with the kids. They do it on their own on the odd weeks. On the even week, she comes in and, and does an hour of Pilates with the kids. Uh, we've got a physiotherapist that comes in on a Friday morning and does a bit of yoga with the kids and uh, um, and they treat swimmers that have got, you know, tightness through shoulders, backs, necks, hamstrings, etc., etc. on that Friday morning as well. So... You know, it's a whole bunch of different people that, um, you know, that I rely on, um, you know, within the confines of our group to try and get the best out of the people we've got there. Yeah, I love it, mate. Good stuff. That's that's really interesting. And uh, I had another question, but I just forgot it because uh, I've had too much whiskey. But um, the... Uh, the <laughs> <laughs> I know you're not kidding too, or that's, that's a little worry. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to me about Dean Boxall. I mean, like you said, Dean worked with you for a number of years and now he's kind of come out of his shell the last couple of years and, and doing, you know, some amazing things. There's a lot of talk ab about him and and um, his talent. Um, what What is he doing well? What What makes this, this young coach um, so dynamic and, and, and such incredible results in, in, at this Olympics especially? I know Dean very, very well. Like um, I coached him for two or three years there when I was at the Valley Pool. And then he uh, coached alongside me for six years at St. Peter's. He was head of the age group program there, so I know him extremely well. Um, and, you know, we've known each other for many, many years before that. But uh, I think his number one asset is just his his absolute competitiveness. He, he hates losing anything. Like he'll uh, make a competition out of everything. When we were coaching at St. Peter's, we used to drag these huge covers off the pool during winter. And Dean used to pick four or five or six of the age group kids and he'd have six kids on one barrel pulling in the pulling in the covers and he'd have another six and he'd be timing them to see who was the quickest. <laughs> so what would be a mundane task, Dean had turned into excitement by having a competition just to see who could pull the covers off the quickest. He's just... He's one of those guys that can uh, just instill that enthusiasm in every situation that he's in. You know, he's a master motivator. He just knows how to push buttons for the people that he's got in his program. I've uh, never seen anything like him. He's, he's just a whirlwind. He's um, got great knowledge of swimming, got great knowledge of people. Um, he's just, you know, knows how to put a program together. Um, he's got sprinters, he's got middle distance kids, he's got distance kids, he's got just covers the whole gamut, butterfly, backstroke, breaststroke, freestyle. He's one of the few people that can, um, you know, coach a large squad. I was at St. Peter's for 14 years and, you know, six of those uh, was with a guy called Mick Palfrey and Mick and Dean are very similar, uh, almost, mm. a, uh, almost a similar style of coach. Can coach big numbers like Dean could do a great job coaching two athletes but he could do just as good a job coaching 22 athletes or 32 athletes. He's just got that ability to go around to every, every single session and just show yeah. him and, you know, drive and commitment. He's just very, very passionate about what he does. And, you know, Mick Palfrey, the other guy in there, he's on this team. When I first started coaching at St. Peter's, we used to have trouble with the, with the heaters in at the pool. The heaters would freeze up. And Mick Palfrey was on the boarding. Uh, he, he, he was a boarding master. St. Peter's and um, he was coming to the Beijing Olympics and Mick got the key to the heating room, opened it up, got a hose out and sat there for an hour and a half to two hours every single morning at about one o'clock in the morning to hose all the ice 
off the heaters so the heaters would work properly so the kids would have warm water the next day. Wow. So, you know, this is the <laughs> this is the type of people that uh, you know, have, have, have sort of come in come into that program and come out of that program and it's it's a no surprise to me why both Mick and Dean are having the great success that they are. Yeah. Yeah, mate. Look, uh, a lot of people were kind of introduced to Dean after his, uh, you know, um, reaction to to Ariane winning the the four hundred freestyle at the Olympics. A lot. I mean, the world was introduced to Dean Boxall at that point, but we've known him for a long time and his passion. And um, you know, it, it's nice to see a coach having that type of emotion. Most most coaches keep their emotions in and but but for him to let it out like that it really meant something didn't it you know i think you know he he's had a mission for the last three or four years like you know, when you look at when arnie came into the program she was swimming okay but i think she was swimming around 412 and maybe even 204 203 for a 200 so mm. she was swimming at a reasonably solid level for a 15 year old girl but nothing nothing outstanding and uh you know dean had this goal he had this vision of where he saw Arnie going and um, probably not a lot of people believed that he could do what he did, but, uh, you know, he, he, he's just proved everyone wrong and, uh, you know, she just seems to be getting better and better every time she swims. You know, she had a great breakthrough at the Commonwealth Games back in 2018, uh, but she's just gone on to bigger and better things 2019, 2020, and she's She's now a double gold silver medalist um, at these Olympics. So, uh, you know, he's mm. he's just done a great job. Obviously, you've got to have the talent within your program, but, um, mm. you know, you've got to have the vision. You've got to have the drive as a coach to try and extract the best out of the kids you've got in there. Yeah. Uh, mate, I saw the impact that um, having the Olympics announced for Sydney ha had on uh, Australia what kind of impact do you think it will have now that Australia's been awarded uh, 32 in, in Brisbane? I think it's going to have a major impact. Um, you know, the Queensland Academy of Sport um, has doubled their funding. So I think that is really going to help, um, you know, not only swimming, but all sports within Queensland, you know, within the state of Queensland. So I think, a lot of that government money flowing in is going to help, um, you know, drag athletes in. It's going to help coaches, uh, you know, retain in the sport. Um, I, think, I really think, you know, with facilities, uh, with infrastructure and everything else, it's just going to make a massive difference. There's going to be a lot of excitement um, uh, in Brisbane, but in, in sort of southeast Queensland with the announcement of the Olympics in, in 2032. It's going to be fantastic. Yeah, well, listen, the first thing they need to do is pay uh, Boxel double and, and pay you triple. That's the first thing that's got to happen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've earned that, mate. Um, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, I agree. Like, look, it's going to be a, a huge thing for Queensland, for Australia. Um, I mean, it, it's it's really exceptional uh, to, to get the games back to Australia again. I think it's going to be it's going to be pretty cool, man. Yeah, you know, probably in recent times, the uh, latest thing we had was the 2018 Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast, and that was really good for the for that Gold Coast Gold Coast community. Like there was a lot of excitement, um, a lot of support behind that. But I think you know, Commonwealth Games is sort of moderate level. You know, the Olympics is obviously the ultimate level. So I think um, it's gonna it's gonna be a great thing for um, you know for uh, coaches and athletes alike. What about you, mate? Are you are you set on thirty two, or you don't look that far ahead? Where, where are you looking? I'm just trying to get past the quarantine, Hawkey. <laughs> <laughs> you got another ten days. No, I'm I'm uh, I'm uh, you know keen to keen to go on through to um, Paris, and we'll just see what happens after that. So I've got three. Three years to, uh, you know, keep myself rolling through. I'm, I'm, you know, getting closer to 60, 59 at the moment. So the next birthday is the big one. And, uh, you know, we'll see what uh, you know, happens after Pat. So I'm still you know, very keen to, you know, keep working with, um, you know, swimmers within the confines of the program and trying to get as many people on that Paris team as I can. Although I have to say only having two athletes on this team was really good. I was looking after Mac Horton as well which was good. I looked after in 19. It was just good to, 
to have him within the group as well. It sort of gave us that balance of two boys and two girls, you know, with Emma and Emily and him and I, it was, it was kind of even, even the numbers up a little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, it was much easier uh, than what we had last time in Rio. We had about six in the group there to look after. I, I think oh, seven actually. And I think, you know, Dean probably experienced the same thing this time. It's, it's a very difficult looking after so many swimmers on a team at a meet like the Olympics. But, uh, you know, Dean, Dean pulled off and pull it off quite well yeah well listen i appreciate your time here this has been nice uh listen yeah just just briefly um what has been the impact of cody simpson coming down there and and swimming with you and um and do you think he has a chance to make that team in paris i think you know cody joining the group has been absolutely fantastic he's he's just such a nice humble Hard-working, great work ethic individual. Um, everyone I speak to, uh, you know, Dennis Cottrell was one of his first coaches and Dennis absolutely loves Cody. I know you work with him, Hawkey, you love him. David, I'm with him, David Mark. Everyone that Cody has just come away just so positive. I know Janelle is looking after Cody at the moment and she's just, you know, she's just blown away by how nice a person he is. Mm. But not only is he, uh, you know, a, a terrific person, person he's just got a great work ethic um you know he's he's got he's got two great parents brad and Ange, that have uh instilled that in uh, uh instilled that in him and uh, mm. i think that uh he's been you know he's made a very very positive influence or positive impact on the group that we've had he's very supportive of everyone that's in the program he spends time talking to the other athletes that aren't in the program he's just very very supportive of everyone um so i'm i'm just thrilled he's in there I think he's got a, uh, you know, he's got a chance of making Paris. He's just got to, you know, continue to improve. I think that's the name of the game. Mm. Fifty-two eight's not going to make Paris. He's got to be looking at, you know, two seconds quicker than that to, mm. uh, you know, make Par- Paris. Matt Temple has taken the butterfly to a new level in Australia, fifty point four. Um, you know, he's sort of far and away our, our best hundred meter flyer at the moment. I mean, with with Cody, it's just working out what his best events are. Like I think you made a good call on picking the 100 flies, the event in the short term to go for. But, you know, he's going to explore a couple of events, 100 free. He's not scared of the 200 fly, 200 free, maybe 200 medley. We've just got to wait and see what event suits him most. Um, you know, 100 fly was the immediate thing because I think to get into too much 200 metre work before the Tokyo trials would have been a mistake. It would have killed his speed a little bit. Um, but I think... You know, during the last part of our winter in Australia and through the early part of summer, we're just going to experiment around with a couple of events to see where he goes. Like medley swimming in the 200 uh, is okay in Australia at the moment. The 200 fly, there's probably openings there. His 100 free, 50.2. I don't know if you thought that was good hockey. I thought that was pretty surprising, mm. actually. I, I really didn't think he'd go that fast in his 100 free at trial. Not yeah, going no, it was, on. No, so, you know, there's really a few nice, possibilities yeah. there for him. Which, yeah 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 um so listen um look uh i think that the bottom line is he's good for swimming he's good for swimming australia uh he's good for world swimming and um and like you said he's a good kid and um he's just going to keep getting better and and he's in the best hands mate uh he could not have picked a better coach to come down and train with in australia so very happy with who who's looking after him so uh Bowley, listen mate i appreciate this the internet hasn't been perfect throughout this uh presentation but you know what i'm just happy i got you and um we'll do it again some other time but uh mate i really appreciate your time today all right hawkey good to be on lovely to see your face again and uh see you soon yeah no it's a pretty face you're right it's a good good looking face <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I love you, mate. I love it. Oh, you can't lose that, mate. Come on, you got to keep that. uh, You know. So, listen, I appreciate this, mate. Good to see you. Um, Stay sane. You know, if you need if you need any help in quarantine, just hit me up, mate. All right. Take care. We've got a we've got a running joke in our group, Hawky. Every time the kids complain about two weeks, I say Nelson Mandela went to prison for twenty seven years on Robben Island. For a crime he didn't commit, he came out a happy man. Surely we into two weeks. 
<laughs> They're sick of me saying it, but I say it every day. <laughs> oh, good I'm luck, mate. All right. Else. <laughs> Nelson Mandela, good luck with it. All right. Take care, buddy. All right.